We have a Homeland Security alert that's fixing to come on. But before it comes on, I have something that I want to say to my viewers in regards to Portland, Oregon. In 2012, after that I had left Knoxville, Tennessee, promised a job over into the Basalt, Colorado area, I went up into the Basalt, Colorado area, which is about 15 miles from Aspen, Colorado, going to go to work for an individual, and after me going through the, their orientation and me being hired and dropping off my tools, I got a telephone call late Sunday afternoon telling me that there was a problem in me becoming their employee and I was asked to come back Monday to pick up my tools and to walk away softly and quietly and act as if that nothing had occurred even though I had driven from Knoxville, Tennessee all the way out to Aspen, Colorado promised a job and in not in violation of that in which what I had obligated towards telling these future employers. The problem was pertaining to what had went on in my life out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The excuse coming from the prior owners that owned the facility was that after State Farm, Farm Bureau and all the other insurance companies that they had to deal with and had dealt with found out who I was that it could and would cause a problem with their workload coming from various insurance companies. They basically freaked out. I come back Monday morning and I had told them over the telephone that I was not going to pick up my tools and pull them out of their facility because at that point in time I was in actuality an employee. I said the only way that I'm going to leave your facility and gather up all my tools is that if you cut me a check for two thousand dollars for expenses of me driving all the way from Knoxville, Tennessee over to Colorado because at the time that I had made that arrangement I actually had a decent job in Knoxville, Tennessee working doing auto body work. They agreed to the terms under the circumstances that I could go to the bank and cash the check before returning back to their facility and gathering up my tools. After me gathering up my tools, I realized that at that point in time that things had fell through, had went south, and that now I was halfway over the state of Colorado not knowing which way to turn. This was in 2012. So, as creative and as adventurous as what I was, I went ahead and continued over the Rocky Mountains and went to the other side of Colorado and went over into the Utah, went over into the um, Levada, Utah area and then struck up towards north towards going up where the Mormons was, stopped and adventured, looked around, didn't see what I needed to see, asked a lot of questions about this and that, and then struck off towards Bozy, Idaho, and kept going until I got to Portland, Oregon. Once I got to Portland, Oregon, I stayed in Portland, Oregon for three or four days, had some pretty good hooks at the time, 
in 2012. Keep in mind, they were still suffering from what had happened to them of the of the collapse going from 2008 to 2009. They were still suffering tremendously in that area in 2012 of jobs being skimpy and their economy basically being shattered. I had made a few telephone calls, stayed in the area, loved the flowers, loved the vegetation, didn't much care for uh, the weather at the time, which was give or take in the uh, beginning phases of October, uh, which was rainy, misty, wet, damp, I guess moving into their fall type setting. But while being in Portland, Oregon, I identified real quick towards what type of a scrappy type area that I was in in Portland, Oregon. It wasn't ritzy. It was slummy. I don't know how Salem was. I didn't stop off in Salem where the capital is towards my way down to Northern California on Highway 5. But I noticed that Portland, Oregon was very scrappy. And now since I'm picking up the readings that I'm picking up from, from Homeland, I realize now why God did not want me to stay up into that area because of all this brutality and violence that has been going on for over a month. Once more, I searched and looked, I identified that that area had been hit economically, harshly, by what had went on in 2008, 2009, as far as the economical collapse at that time, whenever Mr. Bush had to borrow basically a billion dollars to bail General Motors Ford and the housing industry out. I realized that things was tough in that that area and that it wasn't my cup of tea for me staying up there. While I was up in Oregon, I noticed also of your environmentalists, your tree huggers, that it was the only state that I've ever been in that you basically could not pump your own fuel, your own gas. I think since then they have changed that particular law to where now you can pump your own gas. But I took great notice of the hippie type atmosphere from the time I basically left the Mormon state going on up into Bozy where the canals of the trenches or the uh, gorge gorges was but I took notice of the type of people that lived up in that area and how their thinking was and how they conducted themselves so by these activities that's going on that Homeland is fixing to talk about I can identify that yeah they had that certain type of quality about them that these type of skirmishes was probably pretty prominent not only in Portland but probably up towards Washington State as well as the California region. Please listen as these things are intensifying and our president has had to have called on federal troops. I don't know if they're actual troops according to Homeland. They're not actual troops. I'm sure these people have some sort of training, police training in doing what they're doing, but they're basically a goon squad that has come into this area towards protecting and trying to maintain some sort of law and order. 
whenever it comes to total mayhem and anarchy. This is not just going on in Portland, Oregon, but in other parts of this great nation, all over this great nation. So what we're seeing here is basically unprecedented, but at the same time, what we're seeing here is something that has to be done, that needs to be done to maintain law and order. But what we're seeing here could also resonate into something even greater of a uprising type movement that would escalate into a more intense situation or situations. So please, as you listen to this, listen to this and watch this with an open mind. Once more, I was familiar with this area in 2012 before I went down to my niece's place there by Lodi, Lodi, California, just down from Sacramento, California. And I stayed there, give or take, about two weeks of the latter part of October before once more the paperwork presented itself once more about the background of my occurrences that took place out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. They basically costed me my job as well as my uh, lodging all in one day, October the 31st in Northern California. So let's watch this and see where this actually materializes into in regards to this total chaos and Anarchy. Mention moments from now on what it calls the quote violence, chaos, and anarchy in Portland. This as Portland officials are fighting to get federal agents out of the city. Dan Springer has the very latest. Oh, in fact, the press conference is just about. Dan, we're going to get back to you because the press conference is beginning. There is Acting Director Chad Wolf. Let's listen. Federal properties, mainly the Mark Hatfield Federal Courthouse. The department's mission is very clear. We are charged with protecting federal facilities across the country. We have been protecting the courthouse in downtown Portland since 1997 when it first opened. We began to see a rise in violent activity targeting federal facilities in late May in Portland, coinciding with the death of George Floyd. Let me reiterate that the department fully supports those who wish to peacefully protest. Let me say this again, we support and we will protect those who want to peacefully protest. Unfortunately, what we are seeing in Portland every night, roughly from midnight to 4.30 or 5 a.m., is the complete opposite. Again, what is occurring in, in Portland in the early hours of every morning is not peaceful protesting. These individuals are organized and they have one mission in mind, to burn down or to cause extreme damage to the federal courthouse and to law enforcement officers. At times, we also see them targeting city property. These individuals congregate in the same area night after night. We see them planning their attacks. And yet the city of Portland takes little to no action to stop or disperse this crowd. These individuals carry lasers, baseball bats, explosive fireworks, metal pipes, glass bottles, accelerants, and other weapons all targeting federal facilities and federal law enforcement. And yet the city of Portland takes little to no action. These individuals have repeatedly destroyed protective fencing, extensively graffitied the courthouse, torn plywood down from the courthouse and then lit it on fire, have erected barriers to block entrances to courthouses, attempted to breach the courthouse, have thrown explosive materials in the courthouse, and again, the city of Portland takes little to no action. The reasons, the reasons increased DHS personnel are important or in, in Portland is twofold. One, violent criminal activity every single night for 52 nights. And two, the lack of action from city officials and law enforcement. Department law enforcement officers are there to protect a symbol of justice, the courthouse. We mostly do that in a very defensive posture. However, we have been forced because of lack of local law enforcement presence to take measures such as arrest to protect our officials. The law is clear on what our authority entails. Specifically, federal statute states that the Secretary of Homeland Security, and I'm quoting, shall protect buildings, grounds, and property that are owned, occupied, and secured by the federal government. 
The law goes on to state that the department can conduct investigations, again I'm quoting, on and off property in question, on offenses that may have been committed against property owned and occupied by the federal government or persons on that property. In other words, we are expressly allowed to leave federal property to conduct investigations and arrest individuals who have damaged federal property. We do this, of course, in conjunction with the Department of Justice. Many of our law enforcement officers in Portland have other responsibilities around the country. They are away from their families and putting their lives at risk every night. The smear attacks leveled against our officers is disgusting. As it relates to CVP officers deployed in Portland, these highly trained officers are in multi-camouflage wear because they work on the southwest border and they work in an environment that demands that. That is their everyday uniform and it is completely appropriate. They have insignia on their uniforms that read police and they have patches and the, the acting commissioner will talk about that in a little bit that indicate which agency they are from. Let me repeat, these officers are not military. Let's not confuse that. I've seen inaccurate press reporting accusing them of being military. They are not military. They are civilian police officers. I'm of being military. They are not military. They are civilian police officers. They're not military. They are civilian police officers. These police officers are not stormtroopers. They are not the Gestapo as some have described them. Stormtroopers. They are not the Gestapo as some have described them. Stormtroopers. They are not the Gestapo as some have described them. That description is offensive, it's hyperbolic, and it's dishonest. And every law enforcement officer and every reasonable American knows this. While well, I look forward to the day that our officers are redeployed back to their regular day-to-day -day mission, we will not shrink from our duty because of this violence. I've heard the mayor of Portland recently state that the federal government is to blame for this violence. Rational people know that is not true. Rational people know that is not true. I've heard the mayor of Portland recently state that the federal government is to blame for this violence. Rational people know that is not true. He would have you believe that enforcing federal law incites violence. He would have you believe that holding criminals accountable incites violence. In the last 52 days, Portland has declared a riot on numerous occasions because of this nightly violence. And while this action helps, unfortunately, they only take this action when city officials or local law enforcement are targeted, not federal. On July 3rd, before any surge of DHS law enforcement resources arrived in Portland, the mayor said the violence, and I quote, has been going on for more than a month now. Groups continue to target the Justice Center. They continue to hurt small businesses. And, they, and the, these attacks undermine public safety. These words are true today as they were before DHS law enforcement arrived in the city of Portland. My message is very simple. If you're looking to peacefully protest in Portland, the department respects your right to do so. Please do so away from the violent activity that is taking place near the courthouse on a nightly basis for your own safety. If you are a violent rioter looking to inflict damage to federal property or law enforcement officers, you need to find another line of work. We will not retreat. We will not continue, or we will continue to take the appropriate action to protect our facilities and our law enforcement officers. Great action. We will not continue, or we will continue to take the appropriate action to protect our facilities and our law enforcement officers. If you're a local leader, now is the time to step up and protect your community. If you're a local leader, now is the time to step up and protect your community. Work with the department and other federal authorities in Portland to responsibly bring this nightly violence to a close. And if you're the in the media, report the facts, all the facts. Do not glamorize the anarchist and the criminals. And do not perpetuate the false narratives many of us have seen recently. I pulled two headlines, uh, pulled two headlines before coming down here today. One, U.S. official calls protest anarchist. Inaccurate and very misleading. Individuals trying to set fire to a building are no longer protesting, they are criminals. I, or any other senior official at the department, has no problem with peaceful protesters. I've said that a couple of times, I'll say that again. 
Second headline, unidentified federal agents are detaining protesters in Portland. Again, inaccurate and false. As you've heard I say, you'll hear Acting Commissioner Morgan say, all officers are identified as police law enforcement officers. We are only targeting and arresting those who have been identified as committing criminal acts. Like arresting those who have been identified as committing criminal acts. Arrest police law enforcement officers. We are only targeting and arresting those who have been identified as committing criminal acts. Like any other law enforcement agency does across the country every single day of the week. We all have a responsibility to condone the violent activity that is occurring night after night. I was in Portland last week. It's a beautiful city, but unfortunately I saw buildings and businesses shut down and boarded up. I was briefed that the violence has cost the city, city businesses roughly 23 million in lost revenue. We cannot let one of our cities continue to experience this lawlessness night after night. Let me turn it over now to Chris Klein, who's our Deputy Director of our Federal Protective Service, FPS. FPS has the mission to protect federal property across the country. Deputy Director Klein will walk you through the role of FPS, as well as the operational summary of the past few nights. After that, we'll have uh, Acting CBP Commissioner Mark Morgan. Uh, we'll talk to you about the role uh, the CBP is playing in Portland. Thank you. Thanks, Good we will everyone. continue to it's monitor this press conference. Uh, a very, really historic moment. I don't think we've seen a moment like this since uh, the riots in the 1960s when uh, federal authorities were brought in, or even before that when, uh, when federal officers were brought in to desegregate the South against the wishes of some of the local officials. But that's essentially what is at play here. Local officials are taking one position on the federal authorities coming in to, and arresting people, and the federal authorities are taking another position, and federal agents are going to continue to go into these communities that uh, the administration says are completely out of control and are being destroyed, where citizens are being put in danger by anarchists and others, not the peaceful protesters, but by the anarchists, and therefore the federal agents will be continued will continue to go into these areas and arrest people as seen. He also, of course, uh, uh, Chad Wolf, the acting Homeland Security. They're bringing in the goonies. The goon squads. They'll be knocking and beating heads, breaking bones. These people aren't playing. Security director was suggesting that a lot of the headlines uh, were incorrect, suggesting that the, these officers were going in as as uh, uh, unidentified individuals. Uh, some even going to an extreme of saying that they were stormtroopers going in uh, unannounced and unidentified uh, to arrest people. He was making the case that is not so. With me now, they better hope that that's all they call in, because if they have to call in. Uh, people like the UK and federal um, military that's whenever it sure enough gets serious that's whenever the tanks come rolling in whenever the tanks come rolling in you know then that it's on and we're not talking about necessarily water cannons and rubber bullets these people are serious towards maintaining law and order in regard to a mob that has basically taken over parts of this country. It is so sad. As Homeland Security Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli, thank you for staying with us, Ken. I appreciate you being here. Uh, how exactly are these federal agents identified? I mean, are they are they distinguishable sure. from, from no, the police easy officers answer. and others? Very easy to answer. So uh, a CBP officer there in Portland has police on the front, police on the back, and on both arms. They have their Customs Border Protection and, and Department of Homeland Security uh, identification as well. They also have an individualized uh, like a badge number on their sleeve so they can be individually identified but not their name because of the doxing of law enforcement and the threats to their families that has posed. So every single 
officer and agent interacting with the crowds there has has that sort of identification on them. And when they approach an individual <clears throat> who, who may be a suspect or who may be a witness, they verbally identify themselves as federal agents as well. And of course, they've been wearing the same thing with the same crowd every day for a number of weeks now. Now, the violence predates our expanded presence there by more than a month, as you heard the secretary just describe. But uh, these crowds have seen these officers wearing the same uniforms day after day, right. doing their job, all while the, the criminals and, uh, and rioters do their thing. Now, I mentioned that uh, there are parallels to what we're seeing here, as, as uh, horrible as, as seeing our cities be destroyed in parts. Uh, it, we have seen these things yeah, in the past. In sad. the 60s, there were riots. And we have seen the use of federal troops in the past. Of course, they were used to desegregate the South in many cases, particularly the, the universities and the schools that had segregation, Jim Crow segregation laws. Federal troops were sent in against the wishes of the local authorities. So this, do you see that as a kind of parallel with what's happening now? I think that uh, was a, a more widespread and more severe situation than what you're seeing now. I mean, just in Portland, we were doing what we're doing now two years ago when the mayor of Portland publicly announced that when one of our facilities was being attacked, that he was withdrawing police support, local police support. And as you heard the secretary mention, we count on those partnerships. Where those partnerships exist, we don't have to expand our officers on the ground because we, because we achieve more working together. But you have a mayor and a political leadership in Portland that blocks their law enforcement officers from working together with us. So they make all of us less efficient and they make their communities less safe, all on purpose, which is just mind-boggling. All right, uh, let me let me get to uh, the issue of the constitutionality of all this, which, and it, it may indeed be challenged Gladly. in the courts. Uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano, our legal expert here, ha mentioned the uh, what he sees as an unconstitutional uh, view of yeah. what's happening there. Let me play the sound bite and get your reaction. Go ahead and play it. The federal government uh, cannot put troops or, or military personnel or police on the streets without the invitation of the governor or the legislature of the state. That's not only federal law, that's in the Constitution. And as horrific as it is for people who believe in the, the sanctity of the person and of private property to watch this destruction, there's very little that the feds can do about it. What happened in Portland over the weekend, David, was not only unlawful and unconstitutional, it was just plain wrong. Now, I understand that you don't agree with that position, but there are a lot of people who do, no. and, and it may, in fact, be uh, taken to the courts. Are you prepared to argue it, or are you going to go ahead uh, with the force necessary to quell the, these disturbances? Yeah, look, I appreciate other people don't agree with advancing more aggressive and responsible policing, but, uh, and I tweeted about uh, Napolitano's uh, comments there about how wrong they were. He said it's in statute. No, in statute is that we will defend these properties and these facilities, just as the secretary not only noted, he quoted the law. And you cannot find in the Constitution somewhere it says, Federal law enforcement officers can't go do their job at federal facilities uh, in and around them to exercise federal authority well, not, to protect it, federal law. That's I'm not, a I'm not a statement. legal expert by any means. Uh, I, I know very as just as much as anybody knows. Uh, no, about no, no, no. I'm not accusing you. I'm just my passionate question, about no, my, it. My, and my he's question so wrong. is: my question is whether you are prepared to defend it if necessary, all the well, way sure to the Supreme are. Court, or whether Absolutely. you will just keep going Absolutely. on with what you're doing. Yeah, we certainly are well within the boundaries of the law and the Constitution. Uh, this is a layup of a win for anybody who would find a way to legally challenge us protecting federal facilities under federal law um, and executing arrests for people who violate that or attack those officers. That is just it is legally easy to defend, and I am a legal expert. I don't have any problem saying that. And um, it, it's, it's just... It's really a policy argument that right. you hear as opposition. Um, and But let's look at just 
left-wing mayors. In Minneapolis, they took the same approach. We'll just give them room yeah. to riot, and surely they'll be nice, and they'll love us all. Well, it got worse, and it got worse. Even that mayor, even that city council started to advance more aggressive, responsible hey, policing Ken, to take back their about, own city. I only so have about works. 30 seconds before your satellite goes down, but I want to ask about Antifa and whether RICO statute, a federal statute, will be used to try to to get inside of Antifa, find out who's involved, who's funding it, etc. And finally, is Antifa a terrorist organization? Sure it is. Well, Antifa, as that word is used, is probably not one organization. There's a different one in Washington than there is in Portland and so forth. Uh, but organized intentional violence can qualify under RICO, stat RICO statutes for prosecution. That's a Department of Justice question more than Department mm -hmm. of Homeland Security because we do law enforcement. Of homegrown terrorism. The same thing as Timothy McVeigh and, and Nichols that blowed up the Oklahoma bombing. It's homegrown terrorism. Anytime you do destruction and bring harm and hurt to American citizens for any reason it reaches the point of being homegrown terrorism regardless of what department that you try to defy it in or regardless of what policy that you try to justify their purposes in it's homegrown terrorism They do prosecution, okay. but that is an available tool under these circumstances. Ken Cuccinelli, uh, the uh, acting deputy director of Homeland Security. Great to see you, my friend. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Good to be with you. Well, Treasury... Nobody has the right, including myself, of all people, I probably have as much or more right towards, towards lashing out at some of my... I'm going to use the word opponents, regardless whether it be law enforcement locally, law enforcement in Oklahoma, state law enforcement, or federal law enforcement, regardless whether it be state and local law enforcement in Kentucky, or federal law enforcement pertaining to land between the lakes, or it's pertaining to state and federal law enforcement here in Tennessee that has um, crippled or assassinated my character all the way up to Washington DC if anybody has the right in lashing out at these various law enforcement agencies that has tried to cripple the founder of the windmill ministries I would say it would be me. But I know that if I was to do that, that would put me on the same level that they're on, which is violence and hostility, and I would basically be shooting myself in the foot. Not only would I be shooting myself in the foot from their legal law uh, evaluations, but I would be shooting myself in the foot pertaining to the orders coming from the Lord Jesus Christ that says to be wise as serpents but harmless as doves. That vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I truly think that all this is coming down upon to this great nation right now because of various situations similar to mine towards this unjust doing. I mean, I have had multiple, multiple conversations with the very person that planted a bomb in the back of my truck by the name of Pat Burns. That is Captain Pat Burns uh, that works under uh, a different town now uh, other than Oklahoma City, Oklahoma towards still being engaged in law enforcement activities. Pertaining to all this, he has apologized for doing what he done out out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, but as far as me getting any type of official apology from either City Hall or from the county or anybody else over into that area, no, I haven't. Have I gotten any type of of uh, confirmation 
here in Weekly County, the way that they attacked me in 2005 and tried to make me out to be a homegrown terrorist for falsifying files? No, I have not. Have I gotten any type of an apology for what went on just recently whenever my brother died towards, towards uh, uh, trying to say that I was stalking across the road even though it was my brother and I that was concerned about the benefit and well-being of children? Three ch innocent children over there? No, I have not. Have I gotten any type of an apology from Land Between the Lakes and the Paducah uh, Police Department pertaining to how that they incarcerated me and confiscated my truck and put it in pound and it cost me almost $200 to get it out and all the other trouble that they put me through towards not only being evaluated in Four Rivers Behavior Center, but being evaluated in downtown Chicago pertaining to MCC, and then being evaluated in LaGrange, Kentucky? No, I have not. Have I gotten any type of confirmation pertaining from Washington, D.C., after nine tapes went to the White House that helped to eliminate the Cold War between Russia in bringing down the Berlin Wall? And things not being appropriated the way that it should have been appropriated from this federal government. No, I have not. So if anybody has any type of beef with these agencies, I would say I did. I would say I did. But because I'm smart enough to understand their trickery and their entrapment, I'm standing back and I'm watching this thing unfold one piece at a time one episode at a time, one city and, and, and state at a time, until eventually somebody's going to wake up to what the hell I've been talking about towards vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And until they do, it's going to get worser and worser and worser. Keep in mind, these people around here in this area didn't want peace. If they would have wanted peace, they could have supported a ministry that supported peace. The Neals, the Crosses, the people over in Kenton, Tennessee, the people in this area did not want peace. They wanted harm and hurt, rapes, a mutilation, stuff to be tore up, burned up, blowed up, and screwed up. Well, that's what they're getting. They're getting what they wanted. And this includes Tommy Moore and various law enforcement agencies right around here in Weekly County, O'Brien County. They're getting what they wanted because they did not want to support a ministry that supported these things towards supporting peace and utopia. So let them get what they got coming to them. Well, I sit back and pray for these people. Do I enjoy watching what I'm watching? Absolutely not. But I didn't enjoy being treated the way that I was treated neither, like a red-haired stepchild. They treated me like I was the bad guy. They tried to criminalize me by treating me like I was a terrorist. And the whole time, it was these people that didn't have the vedacity and didn't have the gall to stand up against evil the way that they should have stood up against evil. And believe it or not, I blame the Republican Party just as much as I blame the Democrat Party but most of all, I blame the church community parties. I blame the preachers and the teachers and the missionaries and the evangelists for not having the backbone of standing up against all this stuff. They can read. They can interpret the Bible just like I can. They're not stupid. They didn't want peace. Secretary Steve Mnuchin and White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows wrapping up a meeting with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer on the new coronavirus relief bill. Chad Pergram keeping track of those talks on Capitol. A lot, of, a lot to keep track of here inside the Beltway right now this summer. Summers are supposed to be lazy, not this one. I think they realize that if they do not step up to the plate in helping manage some of these downfalls that has fell upon the society, not just in one particular area, but all over this country, that if they don't step up to the plate towards doing the right thing, all they're going to do is add insult to misery whenever it comes to these people protesting 
and lashing out the way that they're lashing out. I don't blame people for being pissed. I don't blame people for being angry. I don't blame people for being upset. And I don't blame people in ways towards them wanting to become violent. Especially whenever you're going to lose your livelihood, whenever you're going to lose your life, whenever you're going to lose your home, whenever you're going to lose your husband or your wife or your children or your car, and you've already done lost your job and everything else. I don't blame these people for being upset. But I don't support the way that they're trying to get it done. I don't support burning and looting and doing what they're doing. I don't support that. God bless them, and I wish them all the luck in the world pertaining to the 99 percenters that, are, that have finally woken up and come out of the woodwork and decided to take this thing off of autopilot. God bless them towards them standing up to the plate and wanting to be heard and wanting to see absolute change done. Real change. Real change. God bless them. But by these anarchists that has basically... Uh, taken over or ambushed this movement or held this movement hostage is not right in how that they are trying to take something that was intended to be good and now all of a sudden it's looked upon as being something bad as far as all these anarchists and all this violence. Yeah, this is going to be a busy couple of weeks here as they try to knock out this bill. This is the first round of negotiations. He met with the Senate Republicans earlier today, Mnuchin and Meadows did. They're in with the Speaker right now. And the key here is going to be what Senate Republicans decide to do. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, indicates that he wants to write the bill. It says he's going to release that in the next couple of days. He's going to write it in his office so he gets buy-in from Republican senators. That does not sit well with Democrats. Listen bill in your own office without any input from Democrats, dropping it on the floor and demanding that Democrats support it is no one's idea of bipartisanship. You can't fool the American people with these facile words that just don't ring true. McConnell says he's aiming for a bill costing about $1 trillion. I asked the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, earlier in the Capitol if they were worried about the cost. He said, quote, we will spend what we need to spend. Now, some Republicans are leery about even doing another bill. As we say on Capitol Hill, it's about the math, it's about the math, it's about the math. And McConnell can only lose for Republicans without needing Democratic help. I think that's a starting place for discussion with the Democrats. Uh, clearly, they have the ability to prevent us from passing anything. I think it's pretty clear they're not irrelevant. We do have to talk to them. Now, can they get this done here? House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has indicated she wants something done by the end of next week. Going into the meeting, Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, indicated that there's kind of an artificial deadline here because unemployment insurance benefits expire at the end of July. They also have to have a discussion about more direct payments. Would they have more? Would they have less? Right. What would that look like, and would that be part of the bill, David? What a mess. Uh, by the way, Senator John Kennedy, the very quotable Senator John Kennedy, will be with us later in this hour. You don't want to miss his take on what's happening there. Thank you very much, Chad. Appreciate it. Thank you. Meanwhile, down Pennsylvania Avenue, President Trump will be holding a Corona Task Force, Coronavirus Task Force briefing in less than an hour from now. What does my next guest want to hear in that? Dr. Nicole Sapphire joins me now. Doctor, good to see you. Uh, what specifically are you going to be listening for, not only from the president himself, but also from the doctors who will be there? Offer any uh, positive policy that would uh, be better than what the president is delivering on. So what would you focus on in terms of substance here? Um, the numbers, obviously, in states like Texas and Florida and others have been very, very tough here over the last few weeks. So if you're the president, you're taking back control of... I'm from companies that manufacture here in the United States. Jake. Yeah, to help American jobs. Kylie Atwood, great investigating. Thank you so much. More than 141,000 Americans have died because of the coronavirus. We want to take the time to remember three of them right now. All of them work for the city of Houston. The fire chief announced that one of his captains, Leroy Lucio, died yesterday. He'd been with the department 
for 30 years. Lucio was more than a, a supervisor. He was a mentor to those coming up behind him. The city of Houston also lost two employees from the Department of Public Works, uh, Natarvia Robertson and Michael Sanchez. They died within 24 hours of each other last week. The Sanchez family wants Houstonians to know that Michael had a passion for serving his city. Our condolences to the Lucio and Robertson and Sanchez families, our deepest sorrows. May their memories be a blessing. Our coverage on CNN continues. Right now, President Trump is supposed to come to the cameras and talk to the American people. Thanks for joining us. CNN breaking news. Welcome to our viewers here in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room. We're following breaking news. Any moment now, the president is scheduled to resume White House coronavirus briefings, but likely without any of the doctors from his coronavirus task force. Uh, there hasn't been a coronavirus briefing uh, since uh, April 27th. Since then, COVID-19 has killed almost 90,000 Americans. Right now, the U.S. is nearing 4 million confirmed cases with more than 141,000 deaths. But there is a small sign of a bit of encouragement as of today. New cases are now steady or falling in as many states as they are rising still. Let's not forget, hundreds of Americans are still dying every single day. Let's get the latest on the pandemic. Our national correspondent, Athena Jones, is joining us right now. First of all, Athena, we're getting some very troubling new numbers coming out of California. Hi, well, but as you mentioned, uh, you're absolutely right. There are some positive signs, more states holding steady than in recent days. But there are a lot of reasons for concern, depending on where you look. Mississippi reporting a record number of cases for the second day in a row. Arkansas setting a new record for hospitalizations and California now on track to surpass New York in total number of COVID cases just the next matter of days. To compass New York. Encouraging signs. The tally of new daily coronavirus cases nationwide falling below 60,000 for the first time in about a week and the positivity rate dipping under 8% for the first time since July 5th. And new cases now steady in 20 states and falling in five. Still, trouble spots abound in the South, the Midwest and the West with nine states in Puerto Rico seeing their highest seven-day average for new daily cases and hospitalizations continuing to climb. This is why it's so important to get the message out. We're still at the beginning of this pandemic. This, as a new CDC analysis, reveals the number of actual COVID cases is likely much higher than the official tally. Depending on the region, the number of people infected was sometimes to 24 times the number of reported cases. More than 50 ICUs in Florida have reached capacity and 39 hospitals have asked the state for additional medical staff. Dozens of nurses have tested positive for the virus. We're running out of, you know, beds and nurses and caregivers and, you know, the trend is in the wrong direction. We're barely, uh, you know, I'd say dancing on the head of a pin right now. In South Texas, Hidalgo County, where refrigerator trucks were brought in to hold excess bodies, a judge issuing a shelter-in-place order for all residents. South Texas is just getting hit incredibly hard and the hospitals are overwhelmed. So overwhelmed that officials in neighboring Cameron County say the case and death tolls are much higher than reported. It's literally impossible for us to be keeping up. The surging cases in many states supercharging the back to school debate. And the most important thing is what we do outside of schools before we reopen to lower the transmission rate. Missouri's governor downplaying the risk to school children who catch the virus in a recent radio interview. They're not going to have to set in doctor's office days. They're going to go home and, and they're going to get over it. Others arguing one child's hospitalization or death is one too many. I like to say to this governor, it is frankly misleading. It is also irresponsible and it is not fair. Children deserve better than this. The startling uh, statistic that you all need to know is that we have 23,000 children that have been tested positive for COVID-19 uh, here in the state of Florida. Florida's teachers union now suing to block Governor Ron DeSantis's order to reopen schools. We simply cannot be reckless with our public schools. That's not fair to our students and our teachers who want to get back to work. In fact, just this morning, Miami's mayor announced summer camps there will be closed after at least three children tested positive for the virus. 
And one more thing in light of the resistance, the ongoing resistance among some to wearing masks and keeping their distance from others, a new study out of the Netherlands finds that if 90% of people did those two simple things, in addition to frequent hand washing, large outbreaks of COVID could be prevented. So it's just another reminder that we have the tools to halt the spread of this virus, even without a vaccine. Yes. Well, start with simply wearing a mask. It's not that hard. Tina Jones in New York for us. Thank you. Let's go to the White House right now. Our chief White House correspondent, Jim Acosta, is with us. Jim, what, what it's been almost three months since the last formal coronavirus briefing uh, over there at the White House. At that time, there were almost 55,000 Americans dead, nearly 1 million cases. Uh, today, it's more than 141,000 dead Americans and almost 4 million cases. It's gotten progressively worse. That's right. Well, President Trump is about to hold this news conference, but it looks like there will be one big difference this time around, as it appears. Some of the main experts from those briefings from earlier this year won't be joining the president. Dr. Anthony Fauci will not join the president for this evening's briefing. And Fauci had expected to be invited when the news conference was announced yesterday, I'm told. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. He won't be there. The president is betting on this plan for more press conferences as a cure for his ailing poll numbers with one White House official saying there is a recognition that Mr. Trump is not viewed as leading on the virus. Been to get out. <clears throat> Hours before the president's first coronavirus news conference in months, White House officials were already struggling to get their story straight, insisting there have not been any inconsistencies in Mr. Trump's embrace of wearing masks. The president's always been consistent on this, that masks, according to the CDC, are recommended but not required. He has said that he would wear one in the case he couldn't appropriately socially distance. Um, and he wore one and put up the picture on Twitter, as you saw. But that's not true. For months, the president has waffled on using a mask, even once conceding to reporters he might change his mind on the issue. He's the guy that has caused all the confusion about all the masks. There in the beginning, they said that you couldn't, that you didn't need to wear a mask unless you was sick. That way you could contain the virus within the mask. Thing about it is, if they would have mandated masks back then, you wouldn't have found them. I remember whenever all this stuff broke out, you couldn't find a mask in none of these Walmarts in Northwest Tennessee. You couldn't find them. They wasn't to be had. They was gone. I just don't want to be doing, I don't know, somehow sitting in the Oval Office behind that beautiful Resolute desk. The great Resolute desk. I think uh, wearing a face mask as I greet presidents, prime ministers, dictators, kings, queens. I don't know. Somehow I don't see it for myself. I just... I just, uh, maybe I'll change my mind. Dr. Anthony Fauci said the president's sudden about face makes the White House more consistent on the practice. I was very pleased to see the president wearing a mask and tweeting about masks. The vice president does that consistently. So I think we've turned the corner. We're on the road of a consistent message. Aides say the president hasn't always worn masks because he's tested regularly, even multiple times a day. He's tested often. I'm not going to read out exactly how many times he's tested a day, but sometimes it is more than one time a day. A tricky stance for the White House, as Mr. Trump has suggested the U.S. should pull back on testing. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. The president is still touting his response to the virus as a success, tweeting, by comparison to most other countries who are suffering greatly, we are doing very well, and we have finalized. So what we're, what we're seeing here is that we're the biggest lab companies are raising the white flag. They're saying, you know what, we don't have that capability. So what I would love the president to say is, we hear you. We have a suite of point of care tests that are that are in development. Yeah. That we're going to do a moonshot. News conference and a task force briefing like we saw earlier this year. Who, as in this case, are hacking in part for their own personal game, but willing to help the state and on call to do so. Well, turning now to Wall Street, stocks mixed on the day. The Dow up 160 points. The s and are. But you don't talk about whether the death rates are declining. We know what they're up to. We know what their narrative, narrative is, and it's all baloney. Yeah, Emily, uh, to Greg's point, I wonder if the way the media has leveled these expectations against the president, if he had been a Democrat, maybe this would have been perceived as a humongous success that he had prevented the spread of more 
virus coming in from China with the travel ban, and then he had taken early action to shut down the greatest economy in the world, and then opened it back up based on the science, and is now encouraging your sons and daughters to get back safely into school. This could have been totally covered differently and if, you know, Barack Obama or Joe Biden had been commander in chief. I wonder if a lot of the perceptions had been so polluted by the 100 percent negative coverage of everything the administration did. That's got to have been infecting a lot of the people's minds about how safe or successful they feel. Oh, undoubtedly, Jesse. A hundred percent. That's exactly what has happened. And I have to say, too, that that's part of what's dangerous, because given that this is a public health crisis, people don't believe what they don't want to believe. So as you say, if, they, if they're inundated with this pre-perception or they're carved into who they believe that they should follow, well, then nothing will change their mind. No amount of data, no amount of facts. It's and got to do part. with bad However, leadership. Resuming these briefings and sticking to data and everything that Greg just outlined, if he says that every day, day after day, first of all, the narrative and the messaging is back in his court. And secondly, it rebuts everything day after day. The and it looks like is, the president is, is taking behind the podium, podium right now. now. To that one, we'll provide an update on our response to the China virus and what my administration is doing to get the outbreak in the Sun Belt under control. Seems largely in Sun Belt, but could be spreading. My team is also working night and day with Capitol Hill to advance the next economic relief package. We're working very hard on it. We're making a lot of progress. I also uh, know that uh, both sides want to get it done. We'll call it phase four. I think we're going to get it done. We'll protect our workers, our schools, and our families, and protect them very strongly. As one family, we mourn every precious life that's been lost. I pledge in their honor that we will develop a vaccine, and we will defeat the virus. We're doing very well with vaccine development and therapeutic development. But I want to thank our brave doctors and nurses and frontline responders. The job they do is incredible and they are truly brave. My administration will stop at nothing to save lives and shield the vulnerable, which is so important. We've learned so much about this disease and we know who the vulnerable are and we are going to indeed shield them. And again, the vaccines are coming and they're coming a lot sooner than anyone thought possible by years. If you look at the old system and look at the new system, I think by years. The China virus is a vicious and dangerous illness, but we've learned a great deal about it and who it targets. Uh, we are uh, in the process of developing a strategy that's going to be very, very powerful. We've developed them as we go along. Some areas of our country are doing very well. Others are doing less well. It will probably, unfortunately, get worse before it gets better. Something I don't like saying about things, but that's the way it is. It's the way, it's what we have. You look over the world, it's all over the world. And it tends to do that. The governors are working very, very hard. And we are supporting them 100%, everything they need, they get. And we are taking good care. We have tremendous supplies and a great supply chain, whether it's ventilators or gowns or just about anything they need. So that's a, a big difference from inheriting very, very empty cupboards. The median age of those who succumb to the China virus is 78 years old. Roughly half of all deaths have been individuals in nursing homes or long-term care. In one study, 90% of those hospitalized had underlying medical conditions, whether it's heart or diabetes, but usually it's uh, some kind of a condition. It seems that people have that, and if they do, it's a problem, no question about it. Young adults may often have mild or even no symptoms. They won't even know they're sick. They won't have any idea that they have a virus. They won't have any idea at all. America's youth will act responsibly, and we're asking everybody that when you are not able to socially distance, wear a mask, get a mask. Uh, whether you like the mask or not, uh, they have an impact, they'll have an effect, and we need everything we can get. Data shows children have the lowest fatality risk, 99.96% of all virus fatalities are in adults. Think of that. 
So that's uh, much, much, much less than 1% for children, young people. By understanding these risk profiles and learning how to treat the disease, we've been able to greatly reduce mortality in the United States. In fact, we'll show you a chart and uh, how well we do compared to the rest of the world. We have several treatments already available that significantly reduce the severity and duration of the disease, including remdesivir, which has been very successful in a widely available steroid treatment. And we have many more happening and coming out. We've learned best practices for treatment of the virus at every stage and have shared these findings with medical providers and we've shared them all over the world. But the relationship with other countries has been very strong. We're all working together. This includes ensuring all hospitals are aware of the importance of different approaches to oxygen treatment, including high flow oxygen, the importance of steroid treatment for those on ventilators. And when you're on a ventilator, uh, we've learned a tremendous about the use of the ventilator and uh, at the beginning, people never had an experience like this, where we needed so many ventilators so fast, and even the use of the ventilators, but the doctors have become incredibly, and nurses and helpers have become incredibly good at the use of a ventilator, which is actually a very complicated procedure, and allocating remdesivir to hospitals based on new admissions since it works best early in hospitalization. And that's something that they've really started. They're using it much earlier. Fatalities nationwide have fallen 75% since mid-April. That's a great number. As cases and fatalities rise in certain hard-hit states, which you're looking at right now, we're surging personnel, supplies, and therapeutics. We, again, have tremendous amounts of supplies. We are in very good shape, and we can move them quickly. Our case fatality rate has continued to decline and is lower than the European Union and almost everywhere else in the world. If you watch American television, you'd think that the United States was the only country involved with and suffering from the China virus. Well, the world is suffering very badly. But the fact is that many countries are suffering very, very, very badly. And they've been suffering from this virus for a long time. We've done much better than most, and with the fatality rate at a lower rate than most, it's something that we can talk about, but we're working again with them because we're helping a lot of <coughs> countries that people don't even know about. I get calls all the time asking for help, especially as it pertains to the ventilators. They need help with ventilators. They have to get them. They're very hard to get. We're making thousands now a month, thousands of ventilators a month. It's been quite amazing. We. Keep doing the good job and things will get better and better. We'll be putting up charts behind me showing uh, different statistics and different rates of uh, success. And I guess you could say also uh, things that we can do better on, but you'll see them. They'll be put up as we go. In April, the average age of individuals who tested positive for the virus was over 50 years old. Today, the average age is significantly younger. Hospital lengths of a stay are almost half of what they were in April. So the stays are about half. The rate of cases requiring hospitalization has been reduced, and mortality among those admitted to the hospital is nearly one half of what it was in April. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about this disease, how to handle it. The doctors have learned a lot, not only in the use of the ventilators, but in many other things. and. Things are happening, too, like the remdesivir and, and other elements, steroids, etc. But these trends could change without our continued and relentless focus. And that's what we have. We have a relentless focus. And it's been that way from the beginning. But we've learned so much. <laughs> I'm going to end right there to my viewers. If you've been staying on top of all this, he's basically reiterating of that in which what we already have known for quite some times uh, towards this coronavirus. Um, <coughs> let him get up there and talk. Thanks again to my viewers and good luck to all of us.